welcome back to week six of the series, The New You. This fall series, The New You, remember, we're basing it on this truth that when you come to Christ, you're a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are new. You have a new identity. You're not what you used to be. There's a new you. And we're breaking down that new you into six truths. The first one is, I am loved. Then I am forgiven. Then I am adopted. Fourthly, I'm a saint. And then last week we talked about the fact that I am purposeful. I have a purpose. Today we want to talk about the fact that I am powerful, that I have power and authority. When I think about this, I think about a funny story I heard years ago about a man who's trying to chop down this tree, but he didn't have any tools. So his neighbor, who's a farmer, brought his chainsaw over and just dropped it off with him. Well, a few days later, the farmer came back to get his chainsaw back and noticed the tree wasn't touched. And the man said, yeah, I couldn't do much with this. I tried, tried game, banging against the tree and I couldn't get anywhere. And the farmer grabbed it and pull started, and vroom, vroom, vroom. And the other man said, what is that noise? He had no idea the power source that he had that he didn't know how to use. Well, you have great power in Christ. And you need to know that what the power is and how to tap into it. So let's give our attention now to James Bedwell as he helps us understand I am powerful and I have authority. Let's listen to James. In Ephesians 1.19, Paul writes that we would know the surpassing greatness of his power towards us who believe, referring to Jesus. Then in chapter 3, Paul writes that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with power through his spirit in the inner man. In both verses, Paul is using the word dunamis. This is the same power that's used to describe Jesus' miraculous power by the Holy Spirit. Paul is praying that we would not only know this miraculous power, but that we would be strengthened by it through the Holy Spirit. In Luke 4, Jesus is in Capernaum, and he cast a demon out of a man in the synagogue. In verse 36, it says, And amazement came upon them all, and they began talking to one another, saying, What is this message? For with authority and power, he commands the unclean spirits, and they come out. See, there's a link between authority and power in the Bible. In Luke 9, it says, Jesus called the twelve together and gave them power and authority over all the demons and to heal diseases. And he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to perform healing. Again, in Luke chapter 10, we see Jesus send the 70 out to heal the sick and cast out demons. In verse 17, we see the results of their ministry. The 70 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And he said to them, I was watching Satan fall from heaven like lightning. Behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. The Greek word used for authority here is exosia. It means the ability to rule or govern over. It's the same word that Jesus uses in Matthew 28 when he says, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. Notice that Jesus says, because I have all authority, teach them to observe all I have commanded you. Well, if we go back to Matthew 10, we see exactly what Jesus commanded the 12 to do. It says, And as you go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. Freely you received, freely give. Jesus commanded us to do as he did and exercise his power and authority here on earth as his chosen representatives of the kingdom of God. Well, at this point, you might say, James, it really sounds like that Jesus was talking to the 12. And I'd argue and say, yes, he was talking to the 12 in Luke 9. But as soon as we get to Luke 10, you see him send out the 70 ahead of him to all the cities. And then in the book of Acts, we see believers that are not apostles also performing signs and wonders. Stephen and Philip are both documented in the book of Acts as performing signs and wonders. And Jesus, in his own words, and the Great Commission says to make disciples of all nations, 
and to teach them all that I commanded them to do. It sounds like to me that he's talking to all disciples that would be created for all time, everywhere. See, all believers are granted power and authority through Jesus. So what's a practical example of this? If I go over to Cooper Street right now, and I walk out into traffic and hold my hand up for the cars to stop, I'll probably get run over. And at the very least, I'll get honked at and probably yelled at. But if an Arlington police officer walks out into the street and holds his hand up, the traffic will stop. Why is that? Well, you see, the officer has the power and authority to do so. He was granted authority by the Arlington Police Department and the city of Arlington. And he has the power to back that authority up on his hip because he carries a pistol. You see, the officer was granted power and authority to do his job. It was imputed to him by the Arlington Police Department. Likewise, every believer carries the power and authority of Jesus. It was granted to you the day you said yes to Jesus as being your Lord and Savior. He not only paid for your sin, but he imputed his righteousness to you. With that comes his power and authority. Jesus has given you the power and authority you need to do your job and carry out the Great Commission. So how do we do that? How do we exercise the power and authority of Jesus? I believe we can break it down into four simple steps. Believing, faith, stepping out, and pressing in. First, we have to believe the words of Jesus and what the Bible teaches us. If we don't believe the words of Jesus or what the Bible teaches us, it's highly unlikely that we'll step out in faith and pray for people. Second, I think you have to move from believing that healing and freedom are possible to a place of knowing that it's true. If you know that Jesus will move when you pray for people and heal and set people free, you'll pray differently. You'll pray with faith. Wayne Kenyon used to always say, you have to know that you know that you know. See, faith is more than just believing information. It's knowing that Jesus will come through for you when you pray for people. Third, we have to begin to step out in faith and pray for people. It can be very awkward and uncomfortable when we first start praying for people. You'll be walking a fine line between glory and humiliation. See, when we pray for people and we step out in faith and they're healed, we get to see the glory of God manifest in people's lives. But when you step out in faith and pray for people and you don't see them healed immediately, it can be humiliating for the person that steps out in faith to pray. Which brings me to my next point. Press in, commit to the process, and become a student of the Holy Spirit. You have to remember, God heals in three different ways. Through intervention, interaction, and intervention. Intervention is what we're talking about in this lesson. That's where we pray for people and God miraculously heals them and sets them free. But sometimes God uses doctors to help heal us through the process of interaction. We do our part, the doctors do their part, and God does his part. But sometimes, God gives us the grace to carry on, like Paul with his thorn in the flesh through the process of intervention. God doesn't change the situation, but he changes us. Not all people will be healed and set free when you pray for them. It's not a personal failure on your part. You have to commit to the process. Too many Christians have sidelined themselves because they prayed for somebody one time, or they prayed for a couple of people, and they didn't see God come through and heal immediately. So they just gave up instead of partnering with God, which brings me to my last point. Become a student of the Holy Spirit. What do I mean by that? Ask the Holy Spirit to show you how he heals through you. See, we're all as unique as the fingerprints on our hands. God moves through each one of us differently. He has a different purpose and calling on each one of our lives, and he doesn't heal the same through each person. Out of all the people I know that move in signs and wonders, no two of them heal the same way. But one thing they have in common is that they all understand authority and power. When I'm in Kenya praying for people, I have to be open to how the Holy Spirit is moving with each person. I have to be completely reliant on the Holy Spirit to know where to put my hands on people, what to do, what to say, how to pray. It's just like Jesus saying he only did what he saw the Father doing. I only do what I see Jesus doing through the Holy Spirit. It's like a relay race with me and Jesus. He comes up and he hands me the baton. He says, here's what I want you to do, James. And I take the baton and I pray and I do and I say everything that I feel like he's telling me to do. And then I hand the baton to Jesus and I let him do what only he can do. 
and then I watch him heal people and set them free right before my eyes. This is how the Holy Spirit works through me. He might work differently through you. Just follow the Lord's lead. Jesus granted his power first to the 12 and then to the 70 and then to the early church. You are part of the disciples that were created in all nations. Jesus has given you power and authority to do all he commanded you to do. And because of this, we can confidently say, I am powerful.